building AI systems that work and understanding those that fail. It's actually fun to present in Utah. It's kind of funny, I haven't presented in Utah since COVID started. And this year I will, I'm giving more presentations out of the US than in the US, which is kind of a different transition. So next, next month I'll be in Dubai. And last quarter I was in Saudi Arabia four different times, four separate trips. So it's kind of nutty, just I'm getting my mileage on, on for travel. Um, one of the things I like to show people when I start talks is I like to show people Utah. And this might not be as impressive to people here, but this is Mount Superior. It's up a little Cottonwood Canyon. It's, um, some people call it the jewel of the Wasatch. And it's actually ranked nationally. It's one of the top 50 ski descents uh, for backcountry skiing. And the next photo I'm gonna show you is taken right here at this point. And this is a photo I took last April. And I think this photo is funny. And the reason I think it's funny is it's actually not, it's not, it's interesting what's below me, but it's, it's much more interesting what's happening inside. And the reason I think this photo is funny is because I'm hesitating. And, and it's almost like there's a war going on. So there's a war between my amygdala, which is my lizard brain, fight or flight, and then there's a war between the neocortex, the mammalian brain, and it's trying, it's trying to decide what to do. And the reason I think this photo, and also, by the way, I've, I've worn heart rate monitors, and if I'm really stressed like this, my heart rate can reach 170 beats per minute in a resting state, which is really interesting to show what is happening in your mind. The other thing that I think is funny about this is, relatively speaking, the amygdala is actually quite dumb. And I laugh because I imagine my amygdala waking up finally and saying, what the hell is happening? How did we get here? We're gonna die. And the neocortex is thinking, we, we are gonna die, but not today. And so one of the themes that I'm going to have throughout this talk, really my, my backbone and my through line is going to be experience. And that's a, that's a main thing when we talk about AI systems that fail. And we all have experience. And so uh, another core part of this talk is intelligence. So intelligence is the ability to acquire knowledge from experience for future decision making. And intelligence is an, it's a fascinating thing. It impacts all of us, but it's not something that we stew about or think about that often. And I'm gonna go through a few animal examples. So take a scorpion, for example. Let's say it has a negative interaction with a crow or, or some other predator, and it's able to survive. Is the scorpion going to be smarter tomorrow? Is it going to be more cautious? It, well, maybe. I, I can't experience what a scorpion experiences, but compared to something like a cat, the cat is gonna be smarter. The cat is, so the, the cat that's hunting if it misses its prey, it is going to learn from that experience. It's more likely to apply it tomorrow. But it's interesting, when you think about intelligence in the animal kingdom, nothing really compares to humans. And we do have some very intelligent creatures like dolphins and elephants and others that can do some fascinating things. But humans are unique. And the reason humans are unique, uh, which I'll get into, the main thing is experience transfer. We can transfer experience through language. The other fun thing, uh, thinking about yourself, so how much have you learned since you were a child? I'm sure it's overwhelming. You've learned so much. Could you as a child do anything you do today at work? Absolutely not. But the fun thing to think about, are you smarter today than you were yesterday? That's not as obvious, especially as an adult. We'd like that to be true, but that is not always true. And sometimes you can actually become rutted where you will become dumber you will have a bias baked into your decision-making from your own experience. And, and so um, that is one of the things we see that can actually hurt innovation because you can get this attitude of, well, this is how we've done it. Or you've probably run into people like that at work. They have 20 years experience. Oh, this is how we've always done it. And what they're doing is they're so rutted in their bias that they aren't open to change. So experience transfer through language, this is something that is fascinating. So humans, we have developed complicated languages where we can transfer experience between our peers, but it's even more impressive because we can transfer experience across generations. So future generations will be scared of a bear. You don't have to witness that. You might hear about it in the town hall. Oh my goodness, I can't believe what that lion did to Freddy. But that can become folklore, can be told in stories. And language actually evolved into mathematics. So we have the universal language which has evolved over thousands of years, and that was required for computers. 
So anyone who's taken computer science as a foundation, you have to learn math. We use math in computers for all sorts of things. Computer vision, optimization, there's a lot of different reasons why we have to use it. So language evolved into math, evolved into the digital foundation we needed for computers. And then we wanted to send that digital information across the wire. So of course we had the invention of the internet. And if anyone here is as old as I am, I don't know if I remember in the 80s or the 90s laying on my back with 15 feet of telephone wire and you're talking to your significant other or your friend, you're just kind of spinning it around and, and we can't go to Mars if we can't cut the wire. So we had to cut the wire. And so we, that evolved into this wireless mobile economy and then we have this explosion in data. And um, I don't remember off the top of my head, but I believe the numbers are pretty, they're overwhelming. I think in the next three years, we're going to create more data than all the years ahead. No, numbers like that, where we're progressively exploding with data. And if you don't believe me, just look at your phones, like the, the amount of data that you're consuming, the fact that you need 5G and, and you're disappointed with 4G. Or it, it's funny when you go back in time and compare internet speeds. I remember I was going to school in Reno and we bought the fastest internet you could buy, three megs down. And I was thinking, oh my goodness, what, what can't I do? I can do anything. I was hosting um, LAN, um, a SQL server, Apache server. Like I was hosting all these servers out of my house. And I thought three megs down, one meg up, unbelievable. And now if you go to Starbucks and if it's less than 10, you're angry. And you're angry, like you're just writing emails and you're angry. Um, so it's really funny what our expectations are. Um, so data, a fun thing to think about with data is data is your experience. So just like you each have your own unique life experience, which is shaping you and defining you, you, a business will have data, data exhaust that they're collecting. And a lot of times that'll go into just these, these dark silos where it's never actually used. That's actually more common in business. You generate a lot of data, but you don't use it. And that's unfortunate because you have the opportunity to leverage that data. And then that's when we had the birth of AI. So uh, you could argue that AI has actually been around longer than computers because we've had predictive models that have existed before computers came around. And you, of course, can build a model. And Python makes this very easy, sklearn. There are so many libraries where you can, you can do in two, three, four, five lines of code what used to take someone like a, it felt like a master's level thesis. Like you, it's amazing what you can do in a very short line of, in a very short block of code. But there's a problem here. The problem is all models are wrong, but some are useful. And I think sometimes with that excitement with AI, we don't understand the responsibility. The, the fact that I can go copy and paste this code from GitHub, throw in my data, run a model, go show that to someone at work and say, let's put this in production. They're, they're, it's actually quite easy. And I think what people don't realize, it, so we'll get into failure in detail. 85% of all AI projects fail meaning they don't provide value. They don't go into production and change the business in a positive way. And for many of these, there's a negative cost associated with the effort. And just like any robot, robots break. Models break. And this, this has surprised a lot of people. And one of the themes that will constantly come up is you need to be proactive. Most people are reactive. So if you've ever seen AI examples in the news, negative press, they're all reactive. They're all saying, oops. They weren't proactively thinking about um, all these different issues that could sneak into these AI systems. They weren't proactively thinking that these AI models might break. And, and we'll, we'll talk through this in more detail. Um, so going back through my experience, so I studied chemical engineering in school. A fun story that I, I share about myself that's maybe a little odd or quirky is when I went to school in Utah State, I lived out in the woods in the snow while studying chemical engineering. And I didn't do this to get attention. But when I told some local media, it got a lot of attention. So it, I ended up being on radio talk shows. I'd get a phone call in the morning, 6 a.m., and the other side of the phone would say, homeless Ben, you're live on the air in Knoxville, Tennessee, and they started asking me questions. And it was funny because with all of the press around it, um, going back to experience and intelligence, I'm 20. If you're 20, no offense, for most 20-year-olds, you still have a lot to figure out. But the funny thing about this novelty is a lot of 20 year olds treated me like I had life figured out. So I'd be walking to class and these college kids were my age. I, I always knew when they're gonna talk to me because they'd start looking at me faster and faster and faster and then they'd get really excited and they'd say, holy cow, it's really you. You are homeless Ben. You're the kid in the news. And 
the interesting thing with that, this is actually why I learned how to program, which is so random. I learned to program because I had to learn HTML and CSS to host a blog because I had followers that wanted to keep track of what I was doing. Um, but the funny thing that I learned is it didn't, any question they asked, it didn't matter what my response was. It was profound to them. So they would see me studying. I, I always had to air out my sleeping bags and I'd come over and say, why are, you do, why are you doing this? Why are you living in the woods? And I would say, I didn't want to waste money on rent. And then 15 seconds later, the poor college kid would say, that's so deep. It's just like, it's not deep. It's, it's dumb. I'm dumb. I'm trying to figure life out. I have met uh, young kids. Mike Wimmer is one who comes to mind. He's 12. We had him on our podcast. He has a more impressive deep learning portfolio than most adults that would apply for jobs at our company. And then another one, another local favorite from Utah is George Mattis, the CEO of Teal. He won the Peter Teal Award, I think, when he was 17. And then he went to found Teal. And I think the average age of his employees was probably late 30s. But he's you know, 18, 19 running this company. So there are those kids that exist, but most kids are not that way. So my first experience with building models is I worked at IM Flash. So that was a JV owned by Intel and Micron. And I'm building process control models that are controlling the chemical uh, flows in the fab. I'm building fault detection models that are escalating. And, and there's different stages of escalation. They're escalating to SPC charting on O. Potentially, there's an issue to paging technicians, to paging engineers, to shutting down the line, which is the most serious offense. If you're shutting down the line, depending on how severe it is, that can, that can add up to millions of dollars. So you want to make sure you're right. But if you don't shut down the line, you better be right too, because that can lead to millions of dollars of damage in excursions. And so it's a fun place to play. I noticed when I was working here, it wasn't that big of a deal to build a bad model. It was essentially a hand slap. If you had a pattern of that, you might be fired. But it wasn't the worst day of your life. And then I went and worked at a hedge fund. And then it was the worst day of my life. So if you do build a bad model that does not continue the sharp ratio or the Sortino ratio, those are the air metrics they care about. Um, it is the worst day of your life to, to that point. But it's interesting because models can get worse than that. So you, you crying or you being screamed at or something, that's, that's not that big of a deal compared to other things that can happen. So working the hedge fund, this is where, really where I got my foundation, worked on a 600 GPU cluster, um, got exposure to high, high risk models, pushing things in production. And then eventually I went and worked at HireVue. So I, I ran HireVue's data science group for four years. And this is a really big deal because you're building models that are predicting who should be screened in an interview process. And we were very proactive. So for two years before we had anything in production, we were thinking about um, bias mitigation because human data is biased. We have unconscious bias. Any data that we get is going to have different forms of bias, whether it's uh, racism, sexism, ageism, other types of biases. And we need a way to ship models and block the bias. And so I believe our team came up with still best in class when it came to blocking bias. And during the Q&A, we can go into more detail about how you do that. But the interesting thing with these models is these models can actually cause a class action lawsuit. So, so there's kind of this escalation to hand slap, worst day of your life, class action lawsuit. And after doing this for four years, I went and co-founded a deep learning automail company with David Gonzalez, and we ran this for three years before it was acquired by uh, Data Robot. And it's interesting, when, I, when we had this company, it can be worse than that. So worse than that is if a model doesn't work as intended, you have to fire your friends. And so that, it, it's interesting that there is always a consequence, but there's a bigger consequence than that. And that, are, that is AI models in healthcare. If the model doesn't work as intended, you killed someone. Now how do you feel? And, but that's actually a place we wanna play. We want to play there. We want to have AI models in production in healthcare systems because we can save so many people. And so, um, so I'm going to show you three examples. This will maybe be a little bit, I, I'm actually going to quiz you guys. So I'm going to show you three examples. And I want you to tell me which of these three examples you think is transformational. So keep in mind, most projects fail. So two of these might have failed. One of these might have been transformational. Try to guess which one. I'm not testing your data science acumen. I'm actually testing more your business acumen. So pretend like you're a CEO, you're a VP, you have an MBA, you don't have a technical foundation, and you need to decide which of these projects was transformational. So the first one is semiconductor. So for this one, this is a 
chemical mechanical planarization tool. So it actually will flatten the wafer after a chemical process to near atomic precision to make sure it's flat. Because when you're putting chemicals on spinning wafers, you can actually get these edge effects and center effects. So it's just a polishing tool. And it has a stone that it uses to polish. So something that happened while I was working there is it started to throw the stone, which is it's actually a little funny. Like it, it's, it's funny, but it's not funny. It's a little funny because this is a multi-million dollar tool that is physically throwing a stone and it's bouncing around inside. This is a, this is a disaster. So it's, and it becomes a big enough deal that is now fab leadership is talking about this problem. They have vendors, they have all these people coming in, trying to experts, trying to figure out why is it throwing the stone. And this was early on in my career where I think early on in your career, you're, you want attention, you want to show how awesome you are. You're trying to figure this out. And I remember when this was happening, I thought, well, I can build an AI model that will predict when this stone will be thrown. But the problem was no single feature showed any signal. So we're talking, anything you can imagine was up for grabs, spin speed, torque, voltage, any physical thing you could possibly imagine you had access to it. So I said, well, I'll just take the kitchen sink approach um, and I'll bring all the features together and I'll build a predictor model. So we'll call this throwing the stone. And I'll go through these others, other ones faster. This next one is called swimming pools from space. So a very large insurance company where we want to use AI to predict if you have a swimming pool on a residential property and they are going to insure your, your home. And then the final one, we'll call this cute sweaters. So this is a large e-commerce company. We want to use AI to automatically add attributes to images that are uploaded into their, their user base. So out of these three, throwing the stone, swimming pools from space, cute sweaters, which of these problems was transformational? And which of these wasn't worth the time or the effort? Any, any guesses, any brave hands? I, I'm gonna see if I can kind of sell these better. Throwing the stone. <laughs> Swimming pools from space. Cute sweaters. This is just adding uh, tags automatically to the images. So if a user is uploading a new product to sell, instead of having humans go through and tag these photos, having AI automatically tag what the photo is. So you're trying to streamline the process to getting it live. Cute sweaters. Anyone else? Okay. So it's a trick question. None of these are transformational, but all of them had transformational use cases. So the first one, I'm not, there were transformational use cases here. This one, the issue that came up is um, you need to understand your intended audience of your model. Who's consuming it? And so I built this model, I put it in production, and it was set to page technicians, and I went home, went to bed. And like any good story, my model, start first night, starts paging technicians at two in the morning. I'm asleep. Um, it's paging technicians, the stone is still on the tool, they turn off the alarm and ignore it, and 30 minutes later, the tool throws the stone. And so I come into work the next day feeling like, well, you should have should have listened to my model. It's genius, brilliant, should have listened to it. And, and it's interesting because this was a failure on my part that I learned later because technicians are going to be very sensitive to false positives. Management will be very sensitive to false negatives because if my alarm had missed a stone, who's in trouble now? I'm in trouble. Uh, so, it, so it's interesting because that... You need to get buy-in. We talk about augmented intelligence. You need to partner with the humans. You can't have a black box model. This is a black box model. These next two, I'll talk about transformation, transformational alternatives. So the problem with swimming pools from space. Yes, you can build a deep learning classifier to predict swimming pools from space near human level, if not better. Now we're gonna talk about how much that's worth. Is it worth millions of dollars a year to that company? No. Is it worth hundreds of thousands of dollars a year to that company? No. As soon as you go less than $100,000 a year, if we're talking $50,000, I'm just going to round down to zero. Well, I'm actually going to round down between zero and a dollar. So the only thing we can agree on is this is worth more than zero. Now, here's the problem. Um, the other models that were available, so loss prediction, predicting the loss on this property using all the available data, is worth $30 million. So this is an example of 
To find this, you would have asked, tell me a number about your business where a very small change makes you excited. They would have immediately pointed you to the loss ratio. You could have built that model instead. Um, so one of the things I warn people about is if you're ever starting a project with, wouldn't it be cool if, I don't need to hear the rest of it. It's a bad idea. Because normally business pro big business impact projects don't start that way. Wouldn't it be cool? Um, you can do cool projects later, but some of the most um, impactful projects for business are boring initially. Um, same thing, uh, same lesson here. So the problem with image attribution is you're going to run into this long tail effect where uh, have you labeled all these previously? Do you trust the human labels? You have some big macro, like you have some, uh, if you did a Pareto chart of the items, you have some items with a lot of observations. You can build great models there. But then you have a long tail where you don't have enough data. So you still need the human process. And is this worth millions of dollars a year? No. Is it worth hundreds of thousands? I don't know. So it kind of goes back into that. I'm going to round between zero and one. Click through rate, going back to tell me a number about your business where a small change makes you excited. Well, that's worth millions of dollars. A very small change is worth millions of dollars. And so those are the types of problems we recommend that people start with because they can be transformational in a major, major way. For, and we've, we've seen examples where companies will have their growth accelerated because of AI implementations. So it's not about maintaining growth. They can even jump in. So HireVue jumped into new markets that they were not expecting. So you can get accelerated growth sometime. Um, so this gives you more of an adult view into model lifecycle. And the red dots, these are points of failure. So the use case, people actually fail at the beginning, which is interesting because I'm, I'm a big fan of failing quickly, but too many people fail at the beginning and they keep going. So you really want to partner with the business. You want to ask them these questions. What's the number of small change makes you excited? Where's your growth bottleneck by human capital? If people don't understand that question, then I'll say, congratulations, I just gifted you a 1,000 humans, one job family, they're experts, they're free. Where are they? And normally what you find is they will put them in parts of the business and they can, they can help out the employees or they can help with the customer and those will be good hunting places. So, so you need an outcome if you're going to do supervised learning. Uh, there's issues with data quality that you're going to have to assess. Do you have access to the data? And now you're going to fit the best model. And this goes back to experience where a lot of data scientists will just, they'll just pick models that they're familiar with. I've heard of XGBoost, I've heard of CatBoost, I've heard of linear regression. Maybe I'll try all five of them. Um, then they're going to find the best features. They want to explain the model. And one of the things that's difficult is documenting the model. So what if I have a model that could kill someone? I probably want some compliance documentation. I probably want more than my name attached to it. I probably want a series of names attached to it. And I want a process, if that model's ever changed, we can find out about it. Um, so model approval, and then integrating it into the system. And it's funny because data scientists love building models, but they don't like shipping things in production because a data scientist is not like your DevOps. If you ask a data scientist, what's your service level agreement, they, they don't know what to say. They're like, that's not my job. That's your job. And that was my experience at HireVue. We build cool stuff. We throw it over the fence to engineering. They react to the 10 gigabyte Docker container and say, oh my gosh, what are we going to do about this? And that's their problem. That's not the data science problem. And then the other thing that comes up is detecting model failure. So the thing that's guaranteed is models will break in production, and a lot of models don't have any detection to detect that. And we actually ran into that, where we would have model excursions in the wild. It's a static object, and, and I can talk about that a little bit. Um, well, actually, I'll talk about it now. So building a model, I build a static object, and I ship it. I can put it on lambdas. I can put it on different distribution platforms, APIs. The model's static. It's fantastic. First month, second month. Third month, I get a call, customer is furious. It's, it's confusing at first because this is static. Nothing has changed. Something changed. So this actually happened to me personally. Um, sometimes with these models, you go on a feature hunt. You're very aggressive on bringing in a lot of features, and you can have the best data governance inside your organization. But if you're consuming data coming from vendors and outside parties, you don't have your hooks in their processes. And we actually had an excursion that impacted us because a vendor changed a threshold that was so minor that they didn't tell their customer base. And this is a big vendor with a, you know, I won't say their name because I don't want to embarrass them, but it impacted one of our customers. But this is something you could have never anticipated. Um, so we've seen this evolution the last 10 years in AI platforms. So this isn't just tied to my employer, but in general. First we had AutoML, then people needed MLOps. How are we actually going to deploy these and detect uh, feature drift? 
And then they realized as they went down this value chain, they had to begin adopting more end-to-end. -end. And then one of the things that has recently been celebrated is this concept of augmented intelligence. So I have worked on AI projects for months where we did not have the subject matter expert in the room because they weren't senior enough. We're meeting with VPs and directors. We're talking about what we're going to do. The technician with 20 years of experience was not invited. And then we find out later. And so I am a huge fan. Whenever we're starting an AI project, who is the human in your business that has worked this process the longest? Their title, is, the title doesn't matter. If they've worked this process for 20 years, they are, they are the closest thing to a genius that we have on this process. They've experienced outliers. They've seen things. And this actually reminded me of my job early on where I would be scared as an engineer the first year at the Intel and Micron. I'd have to go find the gray-haired uh, man or woman to help me. And why am I looking for a gray-haired individual? Because of their experience. They've experienced outliers and different things where they can say, oh, this is kind of like this one part type, or yeah, I've seen this before. And then eventually I became that person after five years. But it's, it's interesting. Um, so Augment Intelligence, it's really partnering with the business. And then we are kind of moving more into these uh, multi-tenant clouds where, where the data resides is no longer important. Is it on Azure, GCP, Amazon? Is it local? We, you, you need a system that just handles it. So this is kind of where we are today, where we have all these systems in place, but there is a place that we're going where I'm very excited to get there, and that is Jarvis for everyone. So think of anticipated action. And so I, my whole career I've been programming, but I see a future where I don't have to program. Why would I have to program? I'm talking to my home. I'm, drink, I'm talking to my home, I'm giving it some instructions. I'm gonna go to bed, and I'm gonna wake up in the morning. And this might feel like science fiction, it's not. So I think definitely in the next 10 years, this is something we are right there with automatic speech recognition. I've built these systems before at Hireview. We are very close where you could have a conversation with your home and you go to sleep. And this is actually funny because I'm, I'm going to personify the AI system a little bit. So while you are sleeping, this AI system is working frantically to fill out your, your orders. But um, inevitably, it's going to become, it's going to hit some roadblocks sometimes. Something's not quite working. This, outcome, this model is garbage. There's something that's going on, or it can't get the data that you requested. And so it needs to try alternatives, next best action. And so it's funny because I imagine you waking up in the morning, you're drinking coffee, and you're saying, okay, what happened last night? And your, your home, the AI system is telling you, and it desperately wants you to be proud of what it accomplished. And you can imagine yelling at it, you're like, oh my, oh my goodness, you idiot. That is not what I wanted. But over time, it gets smarter and smarter. So I, I know we all love programming, most of us do, but I am excited about working at that rate where I don't, and we're already seeing that today with um, GTP3 doing code generation where you request a function design and AI will give you the, the code that can operate that function. So you can look at some examples online. Um, so I'm gonna show you this video really quick that was mentioned. I'm gonna try to go a little bit faster. So this was a really fun project we did with Data Robot, Snowflake, and NVIDIA. It's called 10,000 Casts. I'll show you a trailer. It's a minute and a half. We have a longer form version. It's seven minutes. Let's see if the audio works. When you'll catch a fish. Um, <laughs> that's a tough question. No, you can't predict it. Uh-oh. A fish is going to rise. Well, we could. To anticipate oh, someone fixed it. If a fish will strike on a fly. And so Snowflake, NVIDIA, and Data Robot, we came together and we hiked into the middle of nowhere and we brought in uh, GoPros and cameras to this is why capture I'm all the data, data, capture all the information. Once we have data in them so we can analyze it and build that, I just want to see everything like, why was this person catching more right. fish than other people? I think AI can uh, really be good at something like fly fishing with enough okay. data because there is the aspect of being able to see where the fish moves and you can do that with computer vision. Maybe AI will be better than you <laughs> or definitely better than me. <laughs> Video as a data source is fascinating. How long of a time horizon do we need? How important is time? How important is the environment? The AI has to learn not only what's happening spatially, but what's happening temporally. So is this cast going to work? Is it good? What's been the recent activity in the shop? Surface activity, what's happening with the water and the flow. Before, I, these shots were 90 so crazy. Of the effort was how to solve this problem. How on earth do we solve this? And today, 90% of the effort is what problem do you want to solve? 
that's very exciting because it means that anyone can become an AI user. I apologize for the sound. Let's see. Oh, I've got feedback for a second. Let's see. Um, oh, 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 there we go. Okay. So the final thing I said, and I apologize for the frame skipping and, and some of the, the audio issues. Oh, we're going to skip. There we go. So the fun thing with that, one of the most important things that was heard was at the end, where I'm talking about how before we would spend 90% of our effort building that was my experience. We're going to go do this cool AI system. It needs to scale. It's going to do all these awesome things. Let's go have an awesome whiteboarding session with all the engineers and data scientists that want to be involved. Then we'll spend a year or two building it. And it's going to be really, really hard. And we're going to need a lot of smart people. So my experience was you'd spend 90% of your time building. And we're actually to a point now where you should be spending 90% of your time scoping. Because building it is actually quite minor. So even something as complicated as we want to use multiple video feeds and weather data and, and all these um, other features to predict if we're going to catch a fish. Something like that that might have felt overwhelming is pretty minor. It's more about what data, what outcome do you care to go build. And, and so things are really fun now because you can do some things that feel more personal. So this is a project I did, how AI helps me get fit, where I, I'm demonstrating that I can, I can have a video camera set up in my office and it knows what I'm doing. So it knows if I'm working, it knows if I'm doing pull-ups, sit-ups, or push-ups. But it all, it's not just comprehending me uh, at the frame level, it's comprehending me temporally. So you can imagine me lying on the ground and I'm not doing sit-ups. The AI system will not be confused by that because it's only going to reward me for the temporal action. So th this was a fun use case that is helpful because now I have perfect accountability. It, it's better than me entering into like fitness pal or something where I might forget or I might get lazy. It doesn't care if I'm lazy. It just monitors me anyway. Um, another project that we did a couple years ago, this was not related to data robot. Uh, we were teaching AI to play Call of Duty on the Xbox using reinforced learning. This was a really fun, it, this was actually an image that an artist made named Ron Swallow that kind of de depicts the emotion that came out of this project. Because for three months, uh, Call of Duty's playing in my basement. And it was really fun because I'd wake up in the morning, I'd pour my coffee, I'd run downstairs, and I can hear the, it's shooting, and it's autonomous. And I remember this, this one morning, because it's getting smarter over time. I remember this one morning I came down, and I'm sitting there watching this, watching Call of Duty, and it kills someone. And you would think as an AI professional, I could say, yes, finally, I did it. And I remember in the moment, I thought, oh, this feels bad. This feels scary. There's a monster in my basement. And the monster is trapped in the Xbox. But this artist is depicting that a hobbyist who's teaching AI to play Call of Duty, you could have a data center full of thousands of Xboxes learning to play and getting smarter every day. And this would actually make a lot of sense. It, it would make sense to do this because it's, um, it's you're avoiding premature optimization. Because if I go build a droid, I, I haven't been able to test it in an environment. So this is a way of you learning even faster. Uh, one project that we're actively, actively working on is teaching AI to predict when the home is messy and then turning off the TV. So I've got three young kids. This is great, because now I can take the attitude of clean if you want, where right now my wife and I, we kind of have to behave like the dictators in the family, where we have to get after the kids. Why are you doing this? Um, I think the final straw was the Little Caesars pepperoni being pulled off of the couch. Uh, so that's. So this will be really fun. Uh, should I think this is going to be published next month. Um, so now to kind of wrap this up, AI has the opportunity to change our lives, but only if it is applied. And when I say applied, I mean we need to run as far away from experimental as possible. Because if it's applied, well, 11 kids per day drown in the US and die. And I have a there's a local pool in my community, and there was, a, I believe, a three-year-old kid that was pulled out unconscious. Fortunately, lived. They will do CPR and recover the kid. But the fascinating thing is there are four lifeguards. This is a small pool. There's four 16-year-old lifeguards. How on earth does a kid drown with four lifeguards? So one of the benefits of AI is humans, our, our, attention, is, our attention isn't the best. And drowning is hard to see. It's very easy for even for us in the room, if we were looking at different drowning videos, it, 
If we're not actively looking for it, it's very easy to miss because drowning doesn't look like drowning. But you can imagine, the, the, the thing I love about this story is understanding how AI operates. It really, with deep learning, you can understand the focus and attention. So if a three-year-old is walking, it's very busy. There's hundreds of people. If a three-year-old is walking to the edge of the pool, the 16-year-old lifeguard might be thinking about their tan or you know, they're, they're thinking about the day before or the date. They're, they're half there. They're thinking about TikTok or something. But an AI system, when the three-year-old walks near the pool, that three-year-old is the most interesting thing to that AI system. And that, this is true. So we could actually look at this. You could look at where is the AI system looking? Where is it activating? And the AI system is very interested in this three-year-old kid. The kid hasn't even fallen in yet. And isn't that the system you want for our kids? Don't you want that system? That system doesn't blink. That system even could have additional sensory data that humans can't see. If you want to have infrared or other things that you play with. And, and so huge impact there. The other thing that's quite sad, um, I'm amazed that this is even true, that two kids per month die from blind cord strangulation. Uh, blind cord strangulate, strangulation. Ah, sorry. Um, so the, the thing that could be coming there to prevent that, people worry about smart home privacy. Because if I walk out of the shower, or one of my kids does, I don't want Amazon engineers to be looking at that. Like, I, I don't want any cloud engineer to have access to that data. And I'd prefer if it didn't leave the home. But one of the things you're going to see in the future is you're going to see every home will have an AI server. And you will have dozens of cameras throughout the entire home. That data does not leave your home. But the home comprehends what is going on. And if you want to get really fancy, you can have localized radar. If you have localized radar, they've actually done studies. There's a group in um, LA, they can measure an infant's heartbeat through the wall using localized radar. So if your infant's in the crib over there, they don't even have to go into the room, they can measure the heartbeat. So you can imagine a scenario where heartbeat is interesting because you can detect health, but you can also identify. So I can, your heartbeat has a unique signature. If we had built classifiers, for all of you, when you walked in the room, we could have identified you from your heartbeat using localized radar. So now you can imagine a scenario where your home is, um, if there is an infant or a child in the home that is having an issue, whether it's health related or the rough housing or blind cord, your home knows. And, and I, think, I think this is an awesome future if privacy is taken care of, because I, sometimes as adults, you get distracted. You can be across the street, you're talking to your neighbors, you really should be home based on the age of your kids, but you're not, you're, you know, you're within earshot. So you can imagine something where your home actually will call paramedics without you. Your home's trying to page you, it's trying to get your attention, it's trying to call you, you're ignoring it, you're not paying attention, your home's like, well, screw you, here comes the ambulance because it needs to. So I think there's a, there's a future around safety that is helpful. Um, the other thing too is in, with environment. So we're doing some work right now with oil and gas where we're seeing massive reductions in um, carbon emissions. And by massive, I mean hundreds of kilotons per year potential just by introducing AI systems. And, and some of this comes down to, this is maybe a little geeky, but you, we can only understand some of these chemical processes so well. So even in 2022, or 2022, with chemical engineering, combustion modeling, when it comes to diesel refining, we really don't understand all of it. When you're cracking 20 carbon chains, we don't know all the intermediates. If you burn methane, it'll produce 300 intermediates. If you're doing diesel refining, we don't understand everything. And so we're, we're seeing AI systems where they can predict the diesel quality output and improve efficiencies and reduce carbon emissions. Um, so the final thing, three slides and then we're done. And then it's Q&A. You guys recognize this ad? I think the older people might. This is Maxell Cassettes, 1983, year I was born. So we're actually working on a project right now. So I'm a big fan of Art of the Possible. So we, we obviously work with different partners all over the world. We work with different businesses, and we build AI systems that, that are applied, that offer value. That, that is how we stay in business. But one of the fun things we get to do in innovation is sometimes there's opportunities to really push the envelope of what's possible. So one of the projects that is slated, have you guys heard of GANs, Generative Adversarial Networks? Yes, no? Awesome. Okay. So GANs, so this was a project I did. So the first column is in 2018. I was demonstrating that I could, these people are fake, by the way. They're not real. So I was demonstrating that using AI, I could produce anything. 
and, and by anything, I mean, um, I could produce any age, any gender, any ethnicity, any level of attractiveness. And when I posted this on Quora, it went viral. So I became number one in the world for AI for a few months just because people were so shocked that you could do this and make it this good. Because I was from this, I was saying, well, the modeling agencies will be disrupted now because what do you need? Well, whatever you need, you can just produce it. And you can exaggerate it. And then in later in 2018, the scan artwork was sold for $432,000. And I think this is embarrassing. The quality of this is embarrassing. And the people that did this, they just downloaded open source code. So it's not like they did a brilliant innovation. They just downloaded someone else's open source code, trained it on art, and then they went and sold it at an art auction. Um, but, but then Beeple, they sold their NFT for 69 million. This is not AI art, but this, this is NFTs. And then this is the combination. So these are, if you look on Instagram, these are called GAN NFTs or GAN art. And so these pieces you see here are made using AI, but the human is involved by uh, giving descriptions. Or, so there's a few ways to play with art. You can do random iterations. So you can imagine with an AI system, I can randomly generate artwork and I can pick one I like. I can also write text descriptions and it will produce some bizarre thing. I don't know what the text descriptions were for this. I should have included them in the presentation. So you can come up with a text description and AI will try to attempt what you're typing. And some of these can be quite funny, but some of these are beautiful at higher resolution. You can imagine, oh, I'd actually like that in my home. So the, the project that we're going to do is we're going to recreate the Maxell ad. But instead of the artist, instead of the individual sitting in the chair looking at a speaker, they're going to be looking at a TV. They're going to be sitting in a chair, and the artist is going to be driving an art can in real time with EEG with their brain. And so this will be really fun. And we have some great partners. I can't mention the partners publicly yet, but we have some epic, epic partners coming together that are working on this. And the fun thing with this, the reason this is so different, is the artist is in charge. And the artist is running as fast as we dare to run them, 60 frames per second, 120 frames per second. There are some risks with how fast you run the frame rate. If you run it lower, you're, like, you can imagine seizures or other things that could happen. So the artist is driving, and the artist is essentially moving at the speed of thought. And, and the, the crazy thing with this project is it's not just about them producing art. We can actually m measure where they are in the GAN universe. And so you can imagine when you're doing this, if I say, oh, wow, that was brilliant, can you go back? Your ability to go back, I could actually measure that. I could measure the Euclidean distance um, to say, oh, you were only able to go back 98% or 95%. We can, we can measure that. But the fascinating thing, which I'm the most excited about with this project, is for an artist that's generating art for multiple hours, they will generate something that looks like this, where it's, think of like the, the ant crawling through the universe. We will have um, we'll have their path density, and we can 3D print it into a semi-opaque ball. So now if I'm looking at a semi-opaque ball, if someone lacks creativity, they're going to be very rutted. If someone's very creative, they might be able to navigate the universe fairly well. The other thing that's fascinating is your ability to focus could also be critiqued. Can you control the mind when you want to? And can you allow it to jump out when you need to? So it's almost like um, levy flights would maybe be the ideal scenario. That's, what, that's how sharks hunt. So if you can demonstrate that you can jump and then control and then jump and control, that might be very impressive. But this is one of those projects where we don't know until we're done. Um, I think the talk went a little longer than I intended. So my name is Ben Taylor Data on LinkedIn. Ben at Data Robot is my email. And, and I've been involved with AI for the last decade. So if you have questions on AI, there's a good chance that I've heard a similar question. If I can't answer it, I should be able to point you to some resources or, or potentially follow up. So stop there, turn it over to Q&A.